we're in this series called Living at the Next Level. And we talked about when God gives you an opportunity. We talked about seizing that opportunity when we talked about the life of Abram. And last week we talked about Noah and how God gave him a plan for building the ark. And we talked about the ark being our shelter and safety. And living at the next level is putting our complete and total dependence in Jesus Christ. And so today, if you have your Bible, I want you to, t- to turn to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. And we're going to be talking about two parts of Joshua's life. Next week, I'm going to talk about shout for your victory. You know, shouting is something God has put inside of us that is spiritual. It's something that we should let out of us. I mean, if you go to uh, the game today, if you were in New Orleans and you went to the game today and, and they were able to have the stadium full, people would be shouting. Players are going to be shouting. And there's something about your shout that destroys strongholds in your life. And so we're going to talk about that next week. But today I want to talk about stepping past the obstacles in life. There's going to be obstacles whenever God gives you something to do or whenever God calls you to make a step forward, there's going to be something that will oppose you. And you will have the opportunity to either walk through that obstacle to the other side of the promise or you can quit. But those are really the only two options you have. Because if you stay still, it could be damaging to your life. And the other day I was uh, going through um, some CDs. How many remember what compact discs are? I know that those are kind of antiquated now. It's like records for... um, for those that don't even know what a record is, it's like an MP3 player for old people, okay? And, um, <laughs> okay, older people, myself included. But here's the thing about it. I was going through these CDs, and I found one that we had recorded. When I was a youth pastor, my first youth pastor, we recorded a worship CD um, called Revive Us Again. Revive us again. And we had put a worship team together, and our worship team was really talented. And we had uh, guys on that team, teenagers, that were writing songs. And so we put, uh, I think it was four songs from people in our church on the CD, and we produced it. But it was a challenging thing to do. It was something we felt like God told us to do, but we didn't have the $3,500 that they wanted to produce the CD for us. And I know you're thinking, $3,500, that's not much money to produce a CD. Absolutely, but we weren't paying megastars. We were paying teenagers who were just thankful that they got their music uh, onto the uh, internet. They actually didn't get paid anything. It was the guy that was producing it. But there was weeks of rehearsals. There was 24 hours of prayer going on and fasting for this CD project. We were inviting other youth groups to come because we wanted to fill up an auditorium about this size and and with young people worshiping and have that experience. And and then we we got to the night and we did it. And we only had one take. Most uh, live CDs, from what I understand, they do seven different takes and mix the best ones together. On a recording studio, they do 11 different takes and mix it together. And so we were going to do this in one take with young people to try to get it right in one take. So we got the night together, and thankfully some friends of mine, they brought their youth groups. There was about four or 500 teenagers there that night, and our band was on stage, and they were ready to lead worship, and they did a fantastic job. It was amazing. And then we got all the, the, uh, the recording together, and we went into the studio to do the mix, and we started listening to it. And we were like, oh, dear Lord, did we sound that bad. Because when you record something, you notice every single mistake. And so here I had all this money on the line. We had told everybody we were going to uh, have this CD and we were going to sell it and we were going to uh, offer it. And I'm, I'm panicking. I had some obstacles. So I said, how do we fix this? So we got in there and we started re-recording things, the guitar parts, the keyboard parts. We brought in different vocalists to help blend them with the voices of the young people and all these things. And we ended up finishing the CD, but it was a very stressful two extra weeks in my life with the producer saying, I need more money. Because it was a challenge. But we ended up finishing the CD. It blessed many people. And here's the miracle story of it. On our local Christian radio station in Virginia Beach, two of those songs went to number one on the most requested songs. And they were songs written by young people in our church. But there were obstacles before we got to the promise. 
God promised us that we could do the CD. God promised us we could be blessing to other people with the CD. People were telling us how they were ministered to, how God healed them while they were listening to the CD. But there were obstacles that we had to face. And I had to make a decision. At one point, I just said, let's just quit and not try it. I can move to another town where nobody knows me. But we pressed through. And we finished that CD. And we made it available. Because why? When you are faced with obstacles, you don't run away from them. You ask God, how are we going to get through them? That's what Joshua had to do. In Joshua chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, it says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Tampaites, and the Jebusites, and all the otherites that were in their way. So I want to stop there for just a moment. Joshua was under Moses. Moses had led the people out of Egypt. They had gotten to through the Red Sea. They'd seen that miracle happen. And they got to the Jordan River. And the Jordan River was at flood stage. And so it was overflowing its banks. On the other side was waiting the promised land. But in the promised land, there were a lot of people who did not want to give up that land. See, that land belonged to Israel when Israel had moved to Egypt and they were in Egypt under their own free will before they were enslaved, they had abandoned the promise God had given to them of the land that Abram had promised. They weren't supposed to stay in Egypt. It was a temporary stay. They were supposed to go back to the promised land to Israel. But when they didn't go back for 400 years, people move in. Okay? See, if you go on vacation for two months and leave me your keys, you won't have a home when you come home. Because me and Milano will be living there rent-free. Okay, that was not funny at all, was it? But this is what happened. They moved in. So God, when he finally moved Israel out of Egypt back to their nation, they had to retake it, and they were afraid because the whole generation that had been warriors among the, the Jewish people had died in the desert because they wandered for 40 years. And so now Joshua has an inexperienced army that's never been in battle. They've never seen the miracles of God because they weren't born when the Red Sea parted. And so here he's standing up telling them, hey, guys, God told me that we're going to take the land. Yeah, let's go. And they're like, we need more proof than just your word. So they get to the Jordan River. Sometimes God starts with small miracles because when Moses parted the Red Sea, the part that parted that the, that the scholars believe that the uh, Israelites walked through was 21 miles across. That's a long walk. Especially with water on both sides of you and an Egyptian army coming behind you. But Moses had parted that under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so here they're at this river, and this river is only 100 to 200 feet in width. I, I looked up, we used to live in, in Hampton, Virginia, and the river there, the James River, it's about five miles across. And so five miles is a long ways for a, a river. That's a pretty wide river. But 150, 200 feet, what is that, from the back of this stage to the door or something? So it's not that wide of a river, It's like they get, but it was at flood stage. So if you tried to go into it, you are going to be swept away. And Joshua tells them this in verse 11. He says, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you. Now, take into account this. It's not the Lord of Israel. It's not the Lord of Jerusalem. It's not the Lord of the local province or local city. It's who? The Lord of all the earth that controls everything. Over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, again, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that came down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. So you have a new leader 
who's inexperienced, who's been serving under Moses, who gets a word from God, says, guys, we're here, it's safe, we're on this side of the Jordan, but we're going to go through the Jordan River at flood stage, and we're going to go on the other side, and we're going to fight a bunch of different people whose last name is Ites and take back the land that God promised to us. And so, Joshua probably had a few people saying, are you sure about this? You know, it's nice over here. I like this part of town. I like where we are. I've been totally happy living here, but there's a big river there, and there's lots of people that don't want us over there. Why don't we just stay right here? But no, this isn't what God promised. God's promised something else. See, a lot of us, God's promised you something in your life. Maybe it's a breakthrough in your finances, breakthrough in your relationship, whatever it is. But there's a river standing between you and the promise, and you are afraid to try to cross because you don't know what's going to happen when you get out in the river. Is it going to be destroyed? Are we going to be swept away? Are we going to be overwhelmed by the current? Is there all kinds of problems that's going to hit us? What's going to happen to us? What, where are we going to go? How are we going to survive this? How are we going to make this happen? And God's saying, jump in the water and watch what I can do. Because what does it say? It says before the waters parted. Now, it would have been cool to be at the Red Sea because when Moses prayed and it parted the waters, what happened? It parted and they walked through on dry land. Here, the priests actually have to get into the water first. And I'm sitting here as a pastor. I'm like, priest, pastor, that's me. I have to get in first. I don't swim so good. And they want me to carry this heavy thing called the Ark of the Covenant into the water. And the water is, a, got, is going to part. So you kind of stick your toe in. It ain't parting. It ain't parting. And then you get into the water. God does the miracle and the water stands up. And all the Israelites walk through. And this was a sign to the Israelites that Joshua was hearing from God. Now, whatever obstacle you're facing in your life, there's some principles that we can learn here. Is the first one is this. you got to determine to push through the barriers. There's going to be barriers and there's going to be obstacles that come against you in fulfilling what God wants you to do. A lot of times they come in the form of people and even well-meaning people. But you have to push through every obstacle that comes up so that you might be able to get the victory. Because why? It says in verse 11 and verse 13, the Lord of all the earth is with you. Who are you putting your faith and your trust in? Are you putting it in yourself? Are you putting it in your bank account? Are you putting it into retirement? Are you putting it into your job? Are you putting it into your relationship? Or are you putting it into the Lord of all the earth? If you're putting it into the Lord of the, all the earth, a 100 to 200 foot wide river is not a big deal. If he parted a, a sea that was 21 miles across, he can certainly part a 100 foot river. Even if you've never seen it, even if you've only heard the stories about it. Because a lot of times our faith, we have to operate on stories that come from other people. I was thinking about what Rob was saying with this missions endeavor to the villages. I'm kind of a city person. I would want to, I, I like running water. I like electricity. But this method that they have is amazing to get the gospel into every village. But people might have said, well, that won't work because they don't have cell phones. Well, you could buy a cell phone for them. Because there's cell coverage everywhere. I have been in Africa, and I have been out in the middle of nowhere. Cell phone still works. Because it's satellite. But hundreds of years ago, they said that had been impossible. But today, it is possible. But there were obstacles he probably had to walk through. So you have to determine that you're going through because you know that you've heard from God. When you've heard from God, there can't be any obstacle that keeps you from going through. So you have to trust the word that God's given you and let faith be your first step. They had to step into the water. Look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, that you may know that I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. We have to be ready when we've heard a word from God to operate in faith in that. 
Most of you know that I've traveled a lot. I've been around the world doing missions work and evangelism and outreaches and things. And I've kind of told God this. Anytime you open a door, I'm going to do my best to walk through it. And sometimes people ask me, how can you get on a plane not knowing anybody in that country and just show up there, even in, in, in the person, that you're, the contact that you have, and what if they don't show up to pick you up at the airport? It never dawned on me that they wouldn't pick me up from the airport. I'm so lovable. Why would you leave me at the airport? But I go to these countries, and I go into to minister. And one time we went to this town in Uganda called Rakai. And in Rakai, Uganda, I was working with a ministry there, a church plant, and I was working with a, um, World, uh, World Compassion International, one of those organizations. They were sponsoring this evangelistic crusade. And so we set up a, a stage, and we had gotten a permit that we could have church from 4 to 7 o'clock. Who has church from 4 to 7 o'clock in the evening? Because people aren't, aren't even off work. But in this town of Rockeye, over 80% of the families there, oh, the, the, the parents there, had died from AIDS. And so it was mostly children and young people living in this town with some government authorities. But they said, okay, you can have services. So we set up our, our stage, and we got ready to have church, and we, we were um, met with this warm greeting from the chief of police who said, if you go over at 7 o'clock, you're going to jail. I was like, I don't want to go to jail. Here's an obstacle. I even offered to go meet with her because I thought maybe if I talked to her, it would kind of calm it down. But she was like, if you guys go over. So we were struggling with this. And we weren't sure what to do. There were challenges. There were obstacles. Another obstacle happened. This was around the time that the United States was involved in the war with Iraq. And they had pictures of me up all over town on posters that said, come here, the evangelist from the USA. And there were Muslim guys in the crowd with shirts that said, we support Saddam Hussein holding sticks. And I was with one of my African-American brothers who went with me on this trip. And I said, Lamont, what do we do if they rush the stage and try to hurt us? He said, what do you mean we, Whitey? I'm going to be with them. So I'm by myself. Now, even my friend wouldn't stand up for me. So I'm standing, I've got these obstacles. But you know what? The gospel is not easy. Jesus didn't promise them a land that was easy. He promised them a land. And he told them to get moving across that land. So whether there was a river in their way or there were a bunch of ice in their way, whatever was in their way, they were going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to deal with lack sometimes. You're going to have to deal with struggles in your relationship. You're going to have to struggle with kids. You're going to have struggles with even your relationship with God. There's going to be challenges because without a battle, there can never be a victory. Do you understand what I mean? And so you can't let those obstacles hold you back because each obstacle that you overcome builds your confidence in the power of God. It builds your confidence in the power of God. And so we did three days of this crusade, and finally the police chief was getting angry, and she was really threatening to put us in jail. And I told the leader, I said, man, your hotels are rough enough, bro. I need not to go to jail. Okay, I'm going to wimp. I'm an American, please. And so he said, well, I don't know what we can do. Maybe we can move the crusade. And I said, hey, why don't we try that? Let's try a different location in town. So they found some land, and they set up the stage, and we got ready to do the service in another part of town. Guess what? More people came that night because we moved. See, sometimes the obstacle and the uncomfortableness is God is moving you to do something else, and when you get to that place, you see greater success. And so we went that night, and they set up, and I said, well, where are we? And they said, well, you know how we were behind the chief of police's house? I was like, yeah. He goes, yeah, we're behind the witch doctor's house now. I was like, okay. Out of the fire, frying pan into the fire. And so we set up stage and started preaching. We started seeing people come. And that night, over 30 people gave their heart to Jesus in this small community. And in the Sunday morning church, they had only had 30 people on their Sunday morning services. They had 100 people on that Sunday. Within a week's time, we were able to lead almost 100 people to the Lord and bring them into this church. See, obstacles are only opportunities to build your confidence so that you trust and believe God to do more. 
God can take you past any obstacle you're facing. It says the Lord of the earth twice in this passage. This isn't somebody who is just passing through. This isn't some weak God that they prayed to that was a little idle. This is the Lord of all the earth. And their confidence was built because what did Joshua tell them? In verse 10, you will see the Jordan River part and you will know that we're going to have victory. You can't have victory without a fight. In verse 13 it says, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters that come down from upstream, they will stand as a heap. They will stand as a wall, and you will walk through. That would have been some miracle to see, wouldn't it? But in your life, when you have obstacles hit, do they ever come just one at a time? Sometimes you have multiple obstacles hit at the same time. You might have a sick child. You might have uh, uh, been laid off. And you might have a flat on your car. Three things that are not fun to walk through. But here's the thing. You can only deal with one obstacle at a time. So face one obstacle at a time. Deal with the first one, the obvious one. Get the tire fixed. Simple one. Second one, get that job. Pray that child heal, healed and well. So when you're facing obstacles, you just got to take them one at a time. I used to be a control freak. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to let go of some of that and trust God with things. And I wanted everything fixed all at once, but I'm realizing, you know what? I got to fix what I can fix today and let tomorrow worry about tomorrow because I could be in heaven tomorrow. And why am I worrying about tomorrow when I can't fix tomorrow and I might be in heaven tomorrow? So I'm just focused on what I can do with what I've been given today. And as I see the little victories start piling up, I start to see the momentum roll in my life. And it starts to bless, and it starts to grow, and it starts to become powerful in my life. But training is a prerequisite to engage in your obstacles. Because you have to look back at the obstacles you've already overcome to find how to get through the next one. And God will lead us. But you have to engage sometimes before the miracle happens. They had to step into the water. They had to step in before the waters parted. Isn't that a challenging thing? When you have to step into something before you're ready to step into something. Isn't it amazing sometimes God brings an opportunity your way and you're like, well, you know, uh, let me see here. I need to analyze this, strategize about this. And God's like, yeah, just jump in. Just get moving. Start walking. Start going forward. Because you don't know how it's going to unfold the next step or the next step. But when you start walking, you're depending on someone greater than yourself. You're depending on the Lord of all the earth. And the obstacle is just an opportunity for his glory to shine through your obedience. Obedience is the key to following Christ. What if Joshua said, uh, you know, that, I remember when you did that with Moses, that was great. When you parted the Red Sea, it was awesome. But this is me. That was Moses. See, we get so caught up in comparing ourselves to others rather than being sensitive to saying, God, this is what you want for me. This is what you want me to do. This is how you want me to proceed. This is how you want me to go forward. You have to face those obstacles one at a time, learning from each obstacle how to overcome. That worship CD that we recorded called Revive Us Again came out of an experience that happened to me while I was preaching on the streets in Jamaica. I was 26 years old. I grew up in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina with one stoplight. And I go on this missions trip to Jamaica with my church. I was the youth pastor. I'd really never preached on the street. I'd done street evangelism, talked to people on the street, but never preached in front of a crowd, especially in a foreign country. And so I get up to preach, and one of the guys in our group thinks it would be funny to take one of them pen laser lights and play it off on my chest. Anybody know what I'm talking about, those pen laser lights? Do you know what other laser lights are attached to? Weapons. Yes, yes, guns. And so I'm sitting here thinking, somebody is training in on me to kill me. 
Because just that day, we had driven by some guys that had machetes, and they were cutting something down, and they kind of did this. Because we weren't in the Jamaica that they show you on sandals commercials. We were in the Jamaica, man. And this guy, like, taking his thing and pointed it at us and kind of went like this. So I was like, well, if he's willing to slip my throat, I'm sure he's willing to invest in a gun to shoot me. I'm scared. 26 years old, first youth pastor. is like, God, I've only been a youth pastor for like six months. Can I at least live to see the end of the year? And I started to preach, and I was getting ready to preach, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just came upon me. And there's an old school hymn that we used to sing all the time. It's an awesome song. And it says this, hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. As some of you know it. Sorry for my singing, but I'll just do that once every five years. Thank you, thank you. I got one good up here. But here's the thing about it. the peace of God. Man, just flooded me. And I preached with all of my passion, with all my might, and eight people gave their heart to Jesus right there on the street. See, the obstacle was somebody messing around. Thankfully, they told me afterward. But once I overcame my fear of the unknown, once I overcame the fear of what I wasn't sure would be the outcome, once I overcome the fear of dying, it was okay because I knew that if I died, I was going to be with Jesus. And if I was going to stay right there, I was going to preach and people were going to get saved. So either way, somebody's winning in tonight. But so many times we let fear hold us back because the obstacle looks bigger than our opportunity. And we need to take a hold of that and learn from the past. Learning from our past prepares us for the future obstacles. In Joshua chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, Joshua tells all the people of Israel, 12 leaders, to grab a stone out of the midst of the river. And he takes those stones and he puts them on the other side and piles them up as a memorial. And Joshua tells them that the Lord says this to you, that when your children ask, what is this memorial, what are these stones, they can look back at it and you tell them, this is the time when God parted the rivers and we walked through. So learning from our past and putting it into place in our future helps us overcome any obstacle that we might face. Because, see, the Israelites had one of three decisions. They could have stayed where they thought it was safe on this side and never went to the promised land. They could have gotten in the middle and said, you know, it's kind of interesting living in a river and the water's backed up, so why don't I just stay here? But trust me, the water was going to be released at some point. So that's not an option either. See, with God, you can't go backwards. You can't stay in the middle. The only option you have is to go forward. you got to keep going forward. And every time you go forward, you will find the victory that you need. I grew up in this little town called Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. It's in between Asheboro and Randleman, uh, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. You may have heard of Greensboro. And when I was about... I, I'd grown up in church, and we went to this small little Pentecostal church my whole life, and, and I, I gave my heart to the Lord there. But there was this bigger church in Asheboro that, that everybody was talking about, First Assembly of God. And so when I got 16 and could drive myself, my parents said, you can go to that church. And I started going. I'd never seen 100 young people in a youth group. We had like three or four in our little Pentecostal church. And, and so I was shocked when I went to this youth group. And it was an amazing church. It was an amazing uh, uh, place to be. And we did big productions and we did uh, dramas and we did all these things. And, and we, we, we saw hundreds of people come to the Lord, thousands of people come to the Lord. The church grew to 1,200 in attendance in a town of 15,000. As a matter of fact, because of First Assembly's efforts, just up until about 10 years ago, you couldn't buy alcohol in the city limits of Asheboro because it was a dry city. That, that's, that church was an amazing place to be. But something happened. We got stuck where we were. And today, it's down to just a handful of people. And so here's the thing about it is I'm not trying to criticize what anybody has done. But when God calls you to move, it's good to remember our past. It's good to get into the middle of where God is doing things. But the best place is to go all the way to the promised land. 
And sometimes the promised land is scary. Sometimes the promised land is challenging. But I found the principles that I learned from my days there have prepared me for moments like this. Because why? When you step into your future, when you step into what God has promised you, there's no greater place to be, even if you have to go through a few obstacles to get there. Amen? Let your faith carry on to the next generation. I woke up this morning, and I stood on the floor because we've trained David that if he needs to go to the bathroom, he's to say, Mommy, Daddy, I need to poopy. Now, we need to train him, I need to just wake up, because not every time does he need that, but he assumes that poopy gets a faster response, and it does. And when my legs hit that floor this morning, I was reminded, I'm 51. I'm older. I am not in the shape that I used to be. My mind thinks like I'm 20, but my legs tell me I am 51. Hey, now, let's not go there. No need to throw that stuff out. I have great memories of what's happened in my life. But I don't know if I've arrived fully in the promised land. And so I'm holding on to the promises that God gave me. The promises that God has given to me. And I am going forward regardless of what obstacle is in my way. So whatever it is, no matter where you are and what stage of life. You heard Rob talk about it this morning. They just built faith assembly in Orlando. They had that big sanctuary. That he had a nice big office for the first time ever in his ministry. He had all these wonderful. And God says, I want you to be a missionary and leave it all. The tendency for us is to say, no. Because it's uncomfortable Stepping into a river that you don't know if it's going to part. It's uncomfortable stepping through into a challenge where there could be opposition. But let me tell you something. There's no greater place to be than to see the victory of God than in the battle that God calls calls you to fight. Amen? Verse 10 says this, worship team, would you come? It says, and Joshua said this, said, by this you shall know the living God is among you, and that he will not fail to drive out from you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Obstacles are always a part of the, prom- a part of the promise. But in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said this, These things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. God is my source of overcoming. Those Canaanites, those people that were opposing the Israelites were there. They were a reality that they're going to have to deal with. Let me tell you something. We're in 21 days of prayer and fasting. I think we're on day 13 now. We'll be finishing up on the 24th, 25th. The enemy will try to attack. But he can't have the victory because God's already told me we have the victory. So I pray that you're praying like never before. Because I want to talk about something that's not related just to our church but, or just to our personal lives. But what's going on in the world around us. I said this before. 2020 was a tough year. I think 2021 is going to be more challenging. But here's the thing. I have confidence in God. And there are spiritual forces at work trying to close the church, to silence our voice with this gospel. There are spiritual principalities. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Please understand me. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 says we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers in high places. And how do you do that? Through prayer and fasting. How do you tear down strongholds? There was a demonized person that came to the disciples when they were following Jesus before he was dead and resurrected, before he was crucified. And this demonized person, they couldn't cast the demon out. And they said, Master, why couldn't we cast out the the, the demon? And he said, these only come out by prayer and by fasting. Yeah, we got a lot of things that are happening here. We're going to be discussing, is God telling us to move or stay here in this location? What is God speaking to us tonight? That's a big challenge for us as a church to wrestle through right now. 
But the greater thing that we better be wrestling with is there are principalities and powers and rulers in high places that are surrounding, surrounding our community, surrounding our nation. And watching American Idol, if it's still on TV, is not going to get you through it. Prayer and fasting will get you through it. Dependency upon the word of the Lord will get you through it. There's only one hope for us. His name is Jesus. And we sang a song earlier today. It says, it may look like I'm surrounded. The enemy may look like he's working on every side. And I am surrounded by the enemy. But here's the thing. I'm also surrounded by the Lord of all the earth. And guess what? To get to me, those enemies have to fight through him. They ain't going to win against him. So whatever that promised land that God has given to you, whatever future is lying in front of you, today maybe you feel like there's an obstacle in your way that you don't know how it's going to move. Well, let me tell you something. Here's how you jump into the river of seeing your obstacle move is to get into that vein of prayer and fasting. So right now, I want to put out a call to you. If you're here this morning, you said, Pastor John, I believe God told me something for my future. It's personal, not talking about the church move. I'm not talking about any of these things. I'm talking about personal for you, not even talking about the country right now. You. And there's an obstacle in your way, and you're like, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. God will tell you how to go through it, over it, around it, or destroy it. But you have to be a person of faith. And so I want you to stand to your feet right now. If you have an obstacle that you don't know how you're going to get through it, but you say, God, I'm stepping into the water, and I expect the waters to part. I expect, God, the miracle to happen. I'm engaging right now this obstacle, and I will not be defeated. No matter how big the obstacle is, I look to the Lord of all the earth who is surrounding me and who has promised me victory on the other side. Amen? Now lift your hands to the Lord and get ready to receive. Father, I thank you. There's power in the name of Jesus. And God, where the enemy has placed an obstacle in front of your people today to try to tell them that they can't get past that obstacle into the promise that you've given them. God, I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is going to cause the waters to part. Lord, you're going to cause the enemies to be destroyed. God, you're going to cause them to experience victory because, God, there is no one greater than you. You are the Lord of all the earth. And because they are surrounded on all sides by attacks from the enemy, God, they are surrounded by your presence. And Lord, all they have to do is step past their obstacle. Father, I pray release in this place of Holy Spirit faith and Holy Spirit victory for our church today, God. For every person here that they will overcome their obstacle. Lord, I pray for us as a church wrestling with the will of God tonight and this week and next week. Lord, that you would speak to us what you want us to do. And Father, I pray, God, that you would move in our nation. God, it seems like evil is being unleashed all around us and we're surrounded. But God, I'm surrounded by you and they're going to have to fight through you to get to me. And so, Father, I place myself in the middle of your presence. And I thank you, God, for your victory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You may be seated for just one moment. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, today's your day. Today's the day of salvation. The Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation. And today, God wants to give you victory. God wants to set you free. God wants to be your Savior. He wants to take those sins from your life and forgive you and make you into a brand new creation. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor John, Pastor John, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. Would you just raise your hand? Would you just raise your hand right here? Amen. I see your hand. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? This morning, let me tell you, Jesus said that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord that he is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And today, Jesus can change your life. Would you pray with me? Everybody pray this prayer with me out loud. Dear Jesus, I thank you for forgiveness. 
of my sin. And I invite you to be my Lord and to be my Savior. I believe that God raised you from the dead. And with my faith and my confession, I am born again. I am a new person. The old is gone and the new has come. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.